The following message by Pastor Dennis Clark and Dr. Jennifer Clark is brought to you by Full Stature Ministries and its supporters. For more information about Full Stature Ministries, please visit forgive123.com. That's forgive123.com. I want to give part three today on the role of emotions in developing spiritual maturity. Our emphasis is maturity, not basics. We expect you to go win your friends to the Lord. You do the work of the evangelist, but we want to equip you to do the proper discipleship, training them up in the, in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord. Um, but when we see our, we get emails from around the world, literally, and when we see a common thread, I like to read them from the pulpit. We did last week was uh, a person who shared, and they all kind of have a similar ring to it. So apparently that's our DNA. Apparently that's the part that we minister to effectively. So I'm going to read one that just came in uh, this week. I said, uh, Doctors Dennis and Jen, uh, your teachings have had a profound effect on me. I saw you recently on an archive program of Sid Roth and immediately connected. Uh, your genuine desire to see people set free comes through. I have thus far read Releasing the Divine Healer Within and Self-Deliverance Made Simple. I've been able to truly forgive those who have hurt me as well as myself for unkind thoughts and actions. I really never understood that our heart is really in the belly area, but I see it now from Scripture. And what is so unique about your teaching is that you don't just tell people they need to forgive, as most do. You give them the tools to actually do it. Although I've known the Lord for many years, I was saved as a child, grew up in a Christian home. I've struggled with issues, addictions, and unforgiveness for a number of years, getting minor victories here and there. But this time, however, I have true life-changing victory. Thank you so much for sharing what the Lord has shown you. And I'm working my way through your other books and want to eventually sign up for the online studies. That is typical of the kind of emails that we get. It's basically, I would sum them up, if I sum them all up, is someone who's been in the, in the faith for 30 or 40 years and they said, here's someone telling us how to do what we already knew we were supposed to do. These are biblically literate people, but very often you're told what to do but not how. And I think we need to put pressure on our leaders, including myself, to continually look for the wisdom of application so that when people know biblically what's required of them, learning how to do it. And uh, this uh, series that we're doing on the role of emotions and spiritual authority is a missing link. The emotions were something that you were taught to ignore uh, in many cases, which uh, defies the reason why God gave them to you in the first place. Right? I don't know about you, but you can't be moved with compassion or none of the good fruits of the Spirit without the emotions being the conduits for the Holy Spirit to do that. You know, I don't believe in this, I got the joy of the Lord by faith. That's all I need is faith. I got the joy. You know, that kind of sad, sad Christianity is just dead religion. All right? Or the fakey, hi, I, I've got the joy of the Lord. No, you don't. On the inside, you're bleeding and you're hurting and you're not going to anybody because you put your Christian faith on and it's, it's not faith to say that you're hurting, right? All of those things exist in the church. And I'm old enough now, I'm going to start speaking the truth, not like I haven't in the past, but a, a little bit more blunt. <laughs> and if there was ever ever a need in the church to equip the saints to do the work of the ministry, now's the time. To get ready for a harvest to where you can actually help somebody immediately. Let me, Jennifer, come on up here. I want to show you what we do. When we travel church to church, 80% of you could help someone who's hurting if you did one simple thing. How many know in Matthew 18 it says, uh, you must forgive from the heart? How many know that? Raise your hand. You, you know that's in the scripture. 
It may be in the scripture, but 99.9% .9 of the Christians forgive from the head and then feel like they have to forgive again and again and again like it doesn't work. Right? This is what I did with Jennifer. Jennifer was a trained Christian counselor. I forgive you for that. But she was a trained <laughs> Christian counselor, school psychologist. And when I met, she said, there was people I needed to forgive and I struggled with it for a year or two. I'm going, what? I have no place to put that. And I'm going, here, Jennifer, put your hand down here. Close your eyes. Nod your head when you see that person you've been struggling with for two years. Up here is where your thoughts are, by the way. I don't want to go too fast. You have thoughts up here. <laughs> but every thought, say that back to me, every thought has a corresponding emotion. And they're even stored in long-term memory as feeling thought bundles. Any thought you think of, it's going to have good or bad. It's going to have something attached to it because that's the way God made us. A thinking, feeling, willing, or choosing being. Mind, will, and emotions. This is not rocket science. But it is rocket science when we found out that we traveled church to church and spirit-filled Christians who sat under quality teaching did not know how to forgive. Forgiveness is instant when you forgive from the heart. If you forgive and you're sincere and you forgive from your head and it still hurts, you didn't forgive. It requires a supernatural transaction identical to your salvation experience. Didn't, wasn't it instant when you got saved? I received forgiveness for my sins. Jesus come into my heart and forgive me of my sin. You didn't struggle with it for two years. As you receive Jesus, Colossians 2.6, so walk. You're supposed to live the same way that you got saved. Close your eyes. Think that person that hurt your feelings, nod your head. Where is she seeing that person? Up here. Right? And she's seeing that situation just as ugly as it was at the time she got hurt. Where's the hurt? The hurt's down here. This is the seat of the emotions. This is simple physiology. But this is where your spirit or the door of your heart is. Are you a new creation? What's a new creation mean? You are joined to the spirit. You are one spirit with him. That means there's been, there's been a fusion of God's spirit and your spirit. And it's here is the doorway. This is where you open the door of your heart. This is, oh, here's rocket science number two. When we traveled to some of the best taught churches, they did not know this. We'd say, where's your will? And they would go like this. 98% of the church would point here to the will. This is the will. This is the door of your heart. This is where you yield. This is where you surrender. This is where you open the door of your heart. This is the epicenter. Your spirit fills you head to toe. Mind, will, and emotions, and your spirit fill you. But this is the epicenter. This is the door. This is where you permit or forbid. So now, if Jennifer had someone up here that she saw that she needed to forgive, the uncomfortableness would be down here, right? There's so-and-so. Down here it feels like yuck. I would say let, from your spirit, let the forgiver who lives in you. Who are we talking about? Who's the forgiver? Jesus. Let Jesus in you go to that hurt and through that hurt and nod your head when it changes to peace. What does peace indicate? Supernatural peace. What does peace indicate? That he took your pain and your sorrow and he's ruling now. At least in that situation. He's at least Lord at that moment that you forgive from the heart and you get your peace. Peace with God, peace with yourself, peace with one another. Peace is the indication of the rule of God. Let the peace of God rule. And you know what's going to happen? Five years from now, Jennifer could picture that man or woman that she forgave and that peace will remain because it's the fruit of the Spirit and the fruit remains. 
If you struggled for a year to forgive somebody, guess where you did it? And here's the sad part. Most people were sincere when they tried to do it. But you can be sincere in your head and try to do something that didn't include the Spirit. Now when I say, let Jesus the forgiver do it, He's the only one that can forgive sin. Well, people say, well, what's my part? Your part is when you yield the will from the heart, the new creation you. See, the key is on that word you. You can't heal anybody, but the new creation you can be used to heal somebody. How you use that word you. Some people hear that word you, they think your flesh. No, your flesh can't do it. But the recreated human spirit, new, the real you, the, 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 the new creation you, that's joined together with the Lord. So when you release forgiveness, it's that new creation plus the spirit of Jesus himself that flows out. That's a supernatural exchange. As a matter of fact, if you are a note taker and you want to see results in your Christian life and you want to help other people, demand of yourself that in anything you deal with, with forgiveness or repentance, demand of yourself that there is a supernatural transaction or a supernatural exchange, use whatever term you want, but it's got to be forgiveness and repentance has to be supernatural. Didn't, didn't the seven sons of Sceva learn that they couldn't even do the name of Jesus in the flesh? Right? They tried to cast out, the, well, they thought it was a rabbit's foot. If I just say the name of Jesus, you can't, the name of Jesus doesn't work in the flesh. So it, it must be a supernatural connection and produces repentance and forgiveness rep produces a supernatural exchange but God doesn't leave you thinking and wondering did I do it right he will give you an, your own personal subjective experience called peace and he's the spirit of truth he will not put his peace on a lie he will not play Pentecostal charismatic games on you he's if he puts peace on it you're okay no peace means you didn't do it right okay thank you Did you know that if you could do this, that you could help 80% of the people with these three steps? Note takers, write this down. You could teach a person to properly go to the Jesus in them instead of the Jesus in their head, which is the way they do it, with three words. First, feel, forgive. Now, if you forget those three words... Go one, two, three, and look on our website. Forgive. One, two, three. And say, what was what are those three things? First person or situation. Feel the feeling. Forgive from the heart, not the head. If you forgive from the head and you're so sincere, you're crying and everything, but then it's the yuck is still there, you didn't do it right. This is this this will radically when Jennifer saw me minister to someone before we were married she went this would change the church because we've made it harder than it really is and we didn't make it harder on purpose we made it harder because we didn't we knew sometimes it worked and how many knew sometimes it worked and sometimes it didn't and then you wondered how do I get back to that time where it worked was I holding my mouth in a certain way or what how how come sometimes it worked and sometimes it didn't. It was simply because sometimes by accident you did it the right way. Say that back to me. Sometimes by accident I did it the right way. <laughs> well, we want you to do it the right way on purpose. As a matter of fact, we even coined an expression for this. We called it intentional sanctification. Isn't that a strange term? Intentional sanctification. That means I'm not waiting till I'm bleeding and hurting inside. I come to the Lord enjoying to, to, to sit at his feet, to hear his word, but then I'll say like David, search me, O God. I'm feeling great. I don't know of anything in my head that's wrong, but I'm allowing you to search me. Because up here, Jennifer uh, validated this physiologically, up here you have 2,000 thought patterns at any given moment. Down here in the heart, in the non-conscious, you've got... 400 billion. 
So if you really want God to search your heart, it isn't about, I can't think of anything. I've forgiven everybody. I can't think of anybody to forgive. You're up here. Try this. Close your eyes and go to Jesus within and say, Jesus, search me, O God, for anxious thoughts and hurtful ways. Oh, you'll find something. The other way you can... The other way, just go to your head. You can pretty much say, I'm a great person. You know, I haven't, done, I haven't killed anybody or anything lately. I always like the Ten Commandments about thou shalt not covet. Because right when you think you're doing all of those things, you get down, but did you ever want to? Oh, no, I didn't kill anybody. Did you ever have a thought that you'd like to strangle somebody? All right, well, then you're guilty. So you need Jesus. You need forgiveness. All right. <clears throat> from this point, from this service, if you're a visitor, from this, if someone came to you hurting and you just did what I did with Jennifer, you could actually help 80% of the people. Where the teaching is really necessary is my passion and Jennifer's passion is just like the sexual issues module we're having in January. I want to help where there's some tweaking that's beyond just the first feel forgive. Like how to bring down a mental stronghold, how to deal with demonic hitchhikers that are attached to those open doors of wounds and hurts. But that's the 20% and we've got training for that. But doesn't it intrigue you that you, with just the instruction you got today, could go to the average believer, and I'm talking seasoned believers, and get them to put their hand down here and let Jesus deal with what's down here, not what's up here. Well, you're obligated now. You've got the cure. You've got the cure that would help 80% of the Christians. And if you do nothing with it, you're going to be held accountable. I really believe that. It's that easy. As a matter of fact, can I have someone that has no idea what I'm talking about, that this is all new? Could I have someone come up here? I want to demonstrate with them. If not, I'm going to pick somebody. Okay. Yeah, or, or your friend. Take, vote. Angela, come on up. When I used to call, when we traveled to show this in churches, like the first time we would go to a church, we'd start out with the baby food, the basics. I would call Jennifer up and she says, you know, just to show you, she said, you never called me up as an example that I didn't close my eyes, that if I asked the Lord to search for me, there wasn't something, whether it was my daughter didn't call me and that bothered me and I didn't realize it bothered me. You know, none of us are that always on top of it. All right. Okay, close your eyes, put your hand down here, and we're not going to give details because this is in public, so just uh, nod your head, the first person or situation that comes to mind. Can you feel the feeling that's attached to that? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Let, allow the Jesus in you, you d you're doing it faster than I can say it, go to it and through it till you can see the person in your thoughts and feel peace down here. Mm -hmm. Did you see how long that took? That's the way repentance and forgiveness should take. I see, and I can bear witness to the peace. You can, you can tell when peace is coming from somebody. And all of you have that equipment. You don't have to discern. People say, well, I don't have your discernment. You don't have to discern what's going on. All you do is ask them, did it change the peace? But who did the work then? If you help somebody like this, who was doing the work? Jesus. Not my anointing? It was her Jesus? Oh, well, then I won't be Joe Heavy Speaker, and I need to be seen and heard. Well, this kind of eliminates me, doesn't it? All I'm doing is coaching. Oh, I'm not going to play in the game. I'm going to coach the team. That's rewarding, though, isn't it? Would you like to see your sons and daughters standing on their own two feet, accomplishing things in this world more than you? That's what we're going to need in this next generation. Thank you, Angela. You did great. 
Did you see how quick? That blew, that took Jennifer, when we met and she started getting ministry like that, she basically said, I threw out all my Christian counseling, it's all too complicated and it all takes too long. And too much of it was cerebral. In other words, she would take long case histories. Okay, give me your family line for the last 20 years. And then, and then after you did all this research and all this paperwork, she'd say, oh, here's probably why you're messed up. Because of this, this. Oh, well, thank you. And pay for it. So I, get, so I came in apprehensive as to what was wrong with me. And now I paid for resolving that apprehension with more pressure and I go, thank you, I think. Right? And I'm, I'm, I'm making fun. There'd be some people without counseling, they wouldn't be here today. So, you know, there's a balance there. But I'm just saying, we have a tendency to make it harder than it is. They made salvation hard. Poor Martin Luther. No, you're justified by faith. You ask Jesus to come in. What? After I've been struggling and striving all these years you just say you just ask him to come in that's too easy right but i think if god brings an acceleration to personal relationship we're responsible to do something with it 80 percent of the people you could help and should i give him a little bit on the other 20 percent you could take our seminar because then you covers the whole realm but here's the other 20%. Most people do not know how to deal with a lie. Trust me. The standard mental concept for the average believer is I want to replace the lie with the truth. Doesn't that sound theologically sound? I want to replace the lie with the truth. I like that. But then I want to see how you go about it. So down here, you're all frightened and you're going, uh, 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 fear not. God says, fear not. God says, fear not. While you're afraid. Perfect love casts out fear. Perfect love casts out fear. And you expect results? What's the problem there? What's the lie say? I'm, I'm, I'm frightened. I can't do it. As long as you're in fear... You can renounce till the cows come home. It's not going anywhere. How many were trained in faith camp? Anybody? All right. What they, one of their favorite scriptures, life and death are in the power of the tongue. But what do you picture when you hear that scripture? I picture words, don't you? Wrong. <laughs> That's what's wrong. It's not the words. It's the power of the tongue. It's the power behind the word. If I say, perfect love cast out fear, perfect love cast out If I'm in fear in my spirit and I'm quoting perfect love casts out fear, I'm sorry, there's no anointing on that. That's pure flesh. You're saying the right answer, but you're in the flesh. Do not expect that stronghold to come down. You deal with the power behind the lie. Any th truth that is acknowledging itself Exalting itself against the knowledge of the truth is a mental stronghold, but you cannot pull down a stronghold by talking it to death. Yeah. The only way, because you know the right answers. Most people that have a lie, they know what the truth is in the Bible. But the application has to be, you must remove the power source. Discernment always looks for the source, not the content. Matter of fact, you're supposed to judge a prophetic word by the scriptures and by the spirit. The word and the spirit. You have to know what spirit is behind it because the devil could quote prophecy, I mean, could quote scripture, couldn't he? But I'll tell you what, there's no anointing on the devil when he's quoting it. You, should, you are required to know the difference between what is the source. And this spirit that God gave you knows the difference between truth and error, right from wrong, it knows the difference if you will go to that instead of this. That's the key. So, perfect love casts out fear. 
first thing I do is that, that I'm frightened that uh, nothing I ever do ever works and, and I'm a failure, then I have to receive forgiveness for taking in fear something God didn't give me. God didn't give you fear. God didn't give you a spirit of fear, did He? Isn't that what Paul told Timothy? God didn't give that to you. Then take personal responsibility and receive forgiveness for taking fear in. Isn't that reasonable? I receive forgiveness. How do I know if that forgiveness worked? Peace. There's only two answers in this whole thing. It's either peace or forgiveness. I mean, you, you could help hundreds of people with those two answers. I receive forgiveness for taking in fear. Oh, I can feel nothing. Nothing is good. Say that back to me. Nothing is good. There's people that are pay, they're giving their life savings away, paying for medication to feel numb. If you feel nothing, at least it means you're walking in the light that you have. Right? At least you're not in anxiety or your fear or anger or hurt or bitterness or shame. That's a victory to feel nothing. Nothing means everything's in operational order, at least to the degree you're walking in the light. Doesn't mean you don't need more light. We all need more light. Right? I received forgiveness for taking that fear in. I felt the fear go away. I don't know where it went. I'm assuming Jesus took it. He's the only one that can take my pain and my sorrow. You can suppress it, but it doesn't really go away. I received forgiveness. I feel peace. I renounce that lie that I'm a failure, and that nothing I do works. When you renounce that lie from the place of peace, you're renouncing it from the place of power. Let the peace of God rule. Who's ruling? If peace is ruling, who's ruling? Jesus. If Jesus is ruling, now you have the authority of the believer. All the faith camp people, you don't have authority until you've got peace, until He's ruling. Your confession of the word and decreeing and declaring doesn't work if you're anxious. Be anxious for nothing but by prayer. And when I said let Jesus the forgiver, that's your recreated human spirit bonded together with his spirit. That's both of you doing it. But it's, but it's Philippians 2.13 being acted out right now. What's Philippians 2.13? You should have this memorized in this church. For it is God who is at work both, uh-oh, both to will and to do or perform. So if it's His will and He's performing it, that's flowing out of that new creation reality. That's flowing out of the born-again Dennis. The born-again Dennis to where my will and His will are one and there is out of my belly flowing a river. It's me and God together, joined to the Lord. But it's flowing from the heart, not my head. This is such mild tweaking, but if you did this, you would see results. It's that, it is that simple. It's just that most people don't try it, because either nobody told them you can do it. <laughs> you have an anointing. How many people, even the discernment, how many down here, you don't know how to describe it, but if somebody was really in your face and they were pressing you, or you feel like walking backwards, you feel that, you feel that push in your spirit. Anybody have any controllers in their life that the minute they're around you feel like going like this? Even if you don't, you feel the push? Did you ever have any people around you it felt like they were sucking the life out of you. You know what they really need? They don't need your flesh. You know what they really need? They need for you to drop down to your spirit and let the love of God flow out to them. They need the spirit. They don't need your flesh. But they, they just know that they need and you've got something and I don't know how to get it. And we're going to say, well, let's teach them how to get it. Because then they can get it from the the Jesus in them, their own source. Okay? This was not what I was planning on preaching, but I am very comfortable in doing this. <laughs> so somebody needs to hear this. 
you could help 80% of the people. The other 20% is I prayed with people over 40 years. I found that every 30 or 40 times that I ministered an issue, first person, feel the feeling, forgive, peace. Every time I've ministered, out of, one out of every 40, they will hit a stronghold right while you're praying with them. That would be in the other 20%. And the mental stronghold is handled the same way as first feel forgive. And how do I know if there's a mental stronghold? Well, you'd be saying, uh, I see my mother and she was a controller and, uh, and I'm releasing forgiveness to her. If there's a lie, it will kind of shout right at that moment. I'm releasing forgiveness to my mother. I can't, you can't trust any woman. So what do you do? You continue to forgive your mother. That's where it came in at. You probably had a woman problem before you were saved. You probably are spirit filled and you still have a woman problem. If you want to deal with that, then release forgiveness to your mother if that's where it came in. I release her from demands and expectations. And that lie that I heard, you can't trust any woman or however that lie was fabricated. I from the place of peace, because you forgave, right? You forgave where it got started, where you gave place to the enemy. I've got peace there, so now I can, I renounce that lie that you cannot trust women. And by the way, prayed through a lot of people the opposite way too, you can't trust men. My favorite one was that lady, didn't like men, found the root was her dad left as a child, Said you can't trust any man. That's the way it, the lie cultivated. And when she released forgiveness for her father leaving, feeling the hurt and the pain when she was just a kid, once you receive forgiveness and you renounce the lie, you make place for the truth. Even if you knew the biblical truth your whole life, it never took. You hear people say it all the time, I know God loves me, but what's that mean? means you know the truth, but it's not working. It's not taking. But when she released forgiveness to that father for leaving her as a child, and she heard that lie, you can trust no man. I renounce that lie that you can trust no man. Then we would say, okay, now, because the stronghold is gone, there's a vacancy, right? I renounce the lie. Now the truth can come in. You say, what's the truth? And I still remember all of a sudden she started laughing. She said, there's a man in this house right here in this temple, Christ Jesus. And her revelation was, oh my goodness, I'm saying I love God all this time and I've got a man in this house right here who's, who's there. And it's just like something that you could say, I don't want to think like that, I don't want to think like that. You could spend years saying, I don't want to think like that, I don't want to think like that. That's not the same as taking it to Jesus and bringing a work of the cross to where it's death, burial, and resurrection. All right? and then there's the other areas that can be a little bit complicated, but the most beautiful thing that we saw when we traveled is every time we went to a new church, we had to start with this basics that I'm giving you right now, and most of you don't need it, but I would give this basic, and we started seeing something happen. People started realizing that forgiveness can go toward a person, self, and even sometimes they got mad at God that he didn't do for them what they wanted him to do. So it could be God, self, or others. You need to release that judgment. God didn't do anything wrong, but you need to release that judgment you made against him. God, self, and others. All of a sudden, we started seeing people get physical healings after they forgave someone. And we started seeing remarkable healings in the area of uh, allergies when they started receiving forgiveness for themselves. Isn't that interesting? They badmouthed themselves. You know, people might not talk out loud, but they talk bad about themselves in their head. And God gave you two systems, an immune system to protect your physical body and an HPA, a uh, your adrenaline so that you can run from lions if one comes. Although some people live all day long like they're running from lions and, and that adrenaline rush, which is not God, 
and get addicted to it. But when you talk bad about yourself and have unforgiveness towards self, you eventually tell your immune system that I'm bad. And eventually it'll start working against you. You will get physically sick over the long haul. CDC, totally secular, 90% of all physical ailments are emotionally based. Shouldn't the body of Christ be the healthiest group of people? We're the most forgiven people on the face of the earth. We should be the most forgiving people on the face of the earth. And walk in better health. But one of the areas that you need to look for is self-condemnation. Receive forgiveness for your faults and failures. Don't sit there and just condemn yourself. That's the enemy. He likes to do that. All right, now we're going to get a little bit into part three. Not much. That must be for those Ustream people that don't know this stuff yet, that are brand new. But I think it's really important for the more mature Christians to understand um, some of these concepts. First of all, if you're going to be mature, now, let's, now we're going, we went from the baby stuff now for the mature who are walking strong in the Lord. There's three things, if you're going to have a strong spiritual walk, that you've got to be able to overcome. First, you've got to be able to overcome the lusts and the appetites. And get to the lusts and the appetites. In other words, I've been crucified to the world, the voice of the world. I've been crucified to the world, and the world has been crucified to me. That's what Paul said. That's what we need to do. There's a voice that comes from the world, mostly on the news, <laughs> all right? And it's very effective at brainwashing. I can still remember Denzel Washington. He said, we're in a dilemma. He says, if we listen to it, we're misinformed. If we stick our head in the sand, we're uninformed. We, we obviously need a third option, don't we? I don't want to be uninformed, but I don't want to be misinformed. So the best thing I'm going to have to learn to do is how to hear his voice. In Isaiah 66, it says, there's a voice of chaos or noise in the city. There's a voice from the temple. And then there's the voice of God, which that brings an interesting concept too. Not necessarily is the voice from the temple the voice of God. I think Jesus found that out. John the Baptist found that out. That not necessarily is the voice from the temple the voice of God. There's a voice from the city, and you've got to be crucified that. There's a voice that comes from the temple. There's religion. Most spirit-filled Christians, you've got to be able to make that distinction of when you're being beat up by dead religion. And let that forgiveness become a lifestyle to where you flow in the peace and the love of God. No condemnation. Then we've got to learn that these appetites and agendas that we die to, these bad things, how to bring them into moderation and find out what is God's desires and what is his preferences. And overcome feelings, carnal emotions, physical sensation. This is where your feelings are elevated physiologically and you're into hype. And if the enemy can get a Christian to fall in love with that feeling, feeling so alive, feeling all of that, even at times when it's the Holy Spirit, if he can get you to love that, he can work you then. All he has to do is then bum you out a little bit, and, you're, and you don't respond, you don't pursue God because you don't have that high. You don't feel that feeling. A real Christian is going to have to learn how to die to the God feelings, the flesh feelings, and the physiological feelings. If you really, seriously, if you really want to be proficient in the spiritual life, you're going to have to enter upon a, overcome all three. I did it as a baby Christian, and it shocked me that I felt the joy of the Lord so strong that I thought that was going to be the Christian life forever. When I first got filled with the Holy Spirit. But the first time the feeling left, 
You fall into that trap, what did I do? Did I commit the unpardonable sin? I must be bad. What happened? God left me. All right? In reality, that was to train you to love him more than the feeling. To see how you respond if you keep pursuing him or you're living by that feeling. Without that high, I'm not happy. Do you love me more than the joy is what he told me. And that's when I said, God, if I never, and you need the work of the cross like this, all of you, especially if you've been proficient in the gifts of the Spirit or a flow of the Spirit or anointed in different ways, you need to die to it that if I never felt that again, I'm going to live for you and serve you all the days of my life. Until that happens, the enemy can use the good feelings to control you. He can have you a, a spiritual bipolar. Did you ever notice that after some of the highest highs, you had some of the worst lows? That's all planned. I'm not saying God does that to you. I'm saying God is there available waiting for you to pursue him regardless of circumstances and people. Your goal should be like in uh, Colossians 1, uh, I think it's 9, 10, 11, somewhere around there, it, where it says to be steadfast in circumstances and patient with people with joy. Whoa. That's all of life, isn't it? Steadfast in circumstances, patient with people. I don't think there's anything left. With joy. And not get hung up on the joy. But simply obedience you find the pleasure of obedience that is subtle. What was Elijah's mistake? It's not in the wind, it's not in the earthquake, it's not in the fire, it's in the still small voice. And most spiritual is too quiet for your flesh. And I believe here's what God's gonna be doing to training up a people in maturity, is you're gonna have to understand your emotions, you're gonna have to deal with your emotions. Make those negative emotions your friends. You know, negative emotions can be your friend. Not that you want to embrace them, but you go, oh, Jesus isn't ruling right now. When you want, that, when you want to kill that guy that's going in front of you too slow. <laughs> What's that tell you? Jesus isn't ruling right now. You could literally make it redemptive if you paid attention to what's going on on the inside of you. When peace is there, Jesus is ruling. When peace is not there. But bipolar... Christians, deep sorrow followed by hilarious joy. Great depression after a high excitement. Spiritual coldness after a burning fervor. You've got to die to all of that. And basically say, I'm going to live for him and serve him all the days of my life. And it's obedience. You see, the key is the will down here. And if you don't know where it is, you're going to struggle in your Christian walk. This is where you yield and surrender. What happens when you surrender? Jesus rules. You humble yourself, he gets exalted in you. All right? Now, the devil wants to get your will. But where does he work from? The outside. So he can set up all these little scenarios that will make you happy and make you sad. And happy and sad situations he can get to manipulate you if you're still prone to living by your feelings. Some people feel it's spiritual when they're excited. They've never even really entered into a spiritual union and communion with God through the cross. And boy, they can be easily manipulated because they have to find that high. So they'll go conference to conference looking for a high, looking for something that feels good to them. Not, never knowing if that feel good is the fruit of the Spirit or their own flesh. Easily manipulated. Easily. Why? As much as we need the fruit of the Spirit and an understanding of the fruit of the Spirit, we've got to overcome our love of that. But that's what the, the man told me when he prayed over me. And then the Lord spoke to me and says, Dennis, do you love my feeling more than me? And he was talking about the genuine joy of the Lord. I still had to choose even the genuine fruit of the Spirit. I love him more than that. And the funny thing is, as soon as I said, if I never feel a feeling again, I'm going to live for you and serve you all the days of my life, it came back to where I could feel the subtle peace of God 
as a constant, and that's been years and years and years. For me, I practice the presence of God. We teach people to drop down and deal with stuff. I don't drop down and deal with stuff. I stay down. I deal with any time it comes up. <laughs> it should be most of the time down, and occasionally you get in your head. Not the other way around. Live in the flesh all day long, and when there's a problem, drop down and deal with it. That's, that's kindergarten. The key is to maintain it, and when you lose it, the flags go off. Uh-oh, that upset me. Uh-oh, I got blindsided. I took a hurt in. Uh-oh. Something Watchman Nee used to call the normal Christian life. <laughs> All right? So a believer's emotional life, the ups and the downs, the bipolar I taught my nurses, and we had emergency room nurses, and ICU nurses in my first pastorate, and they love this truth. I want to teach it to you, too, because you're all in the marketplace. You're not in church 90% of the week, are you? You're in the real world. You need to practice in hostile environments in church where it's semi-hostile. <laughs> Just deal with Christians. Practice in church. Dealing with attitudes. But when you get in the real world, they're, they're, they're liars, cheaters, greedy. And they're just acting like unsaved people should. As a matter of fact, I used to be pleasantly surprised that they weren't as bad as they potentially could be in, in spite of the fact that the prince of the power of the air is ruling over their will and they think they're just doing what they want to do. Right? And such were some of us. Right? Thank God when you see a kind person. But even then... If they're kind, they've got something to gain by, usually. There's something in it for them. But in understanding uh, these emotional ups and downs, we could take it a step further, too, and say, what I did with these nurses, what they were taught to do, even, and what church people do, is, I'm, let's, let's suppose I'm a, a doctor or a nurse in the emergency room high pressure, right? Situations come in and you've got to make, they learn to not feel. They stuff their emotion. Like I cannot get emotionally involved with these bleeding people, gunshot wounds and what have you. And the only way I know not to feel bad or get upset about the condition that I'm looking at is I choose, when you choose not to feel, what, what's operating? Your will, is holding it underwater like a rubber ball underwater. Suppression. But what gets suppressed will get expressed later. And so I noticed that my nurses, when they were learning some of the stuff we were teaching, when they would go home from work, they decompressed. I don't want to talk to nobody. I ain't going to answer the phone. Leave me alone that what goes down will come up and found out that that's very unhealthy for a believer. Unsaved people, they probably have no other choice. What, what do they do? I don't know. But a believer has the option of holding the heart open to God and maintaining peace and physiologically your IQ is operating at optimum even in a, an intense emergency room situation. Peace allows everything to function properly. Adrenaline, you can only live on that so long. So when you all of a sudden release to peace, you actually accomplish more with less effort. And my nurses were given testimonies of this, of how dramatic it was that not only were they sharp enough to do their job mentally, but by maintaining the peace, they had a discernment added in the mix. And she would say, I know I didn't have to check on room six for another 15 minutes, wasn't on the schedule, but felt, had a nudge in my gut to go check that room. 
If you're stuffing your emotions, your discernment is out the window. You don't really have any. Discernment requires, I'm talking spiritual Jesus discernment. Real discernment comes from the love of God. Where's the love of God? Inside. How, how is it displayed most of the time? Peace. Love resting. Love ruling. So it's both resting, but it's ruling. When peace is resting and ruling, love precedes that peace. Peace is the way we can tell that love is resting, love is ruling. Let the peace of God rule, right? Now, when you're at peace, the outside of that peace is like a semi-permeable membrane. It picks up everything that's going on in the spirit. It's like an antenna. From the place of peace, if someone's talking to you and they're a little bit irritated, down here, you will hear their words, but down here you will feel the irritation that's attached to those words. But these nurses were finding out, I didn't need to go to room six, but just felt led to check anyway and caught an emergency situation that was not in protocol. So not only did she, or was it easier to accomplish more with less effort in protocol, it also opened up the, the intuitive realm to where she could respond in cases more effectively. Or don't you believe Christians should be at the right place at the right time? But how can you be at the right place at the right time if your emotions are clouding out your discernment? You'll probably always be in the wrong place at the wrong time. My favorite one was in my first church when I discerned it was when the six teenage girls came or six teenage boys, I don't remember which it was. They came to the church and they're looking around they don't see no teenage girls so they left that Wednesday. Next Wednesday, six teenage girls came in and they're looking around. We heard there was, we heard there was young guys here. That's going to be the story of your life if you live in the flesh. <laughs> you will always be in the wrong place at the wrong time living by your feelings. But if you would have just said, God, do you want me here? Everything works out. You'll be in the right place at the right time. This applies on your job. This is not a church building. I'm talking on your job. Do you think the emotions then need to be dealt with for your own spiritual walk? Be anxious for nothing but by prayer. There are Christians, gifted Christians, who live in low-grade anxiety most of the time. We can medicate them. Or we can teach them how to walk in the supernatural and teach them how to honor God by honoring his peace. Honoring his rule, really. Not just Savior, Lord. Isaiah 66. When I saw that there's a voice of noise from the city, there's a voice from the temple, there's a voice of the Lord. The way the Lord spoke that to me years ago was we're under the government of voice. Isn't the Word of God the ultimate authority? But ultimately, the Word of God needs the nature of God attached to it. So as far as authority structure, God's nature first, then His Word. Uh-oh. I'm putting Jesus as His presence, His nature. And, and I saw it on Facebook, corroborated in an example, where a bunch of shepherds, used the same words to try to bring the sheep in, but they wouldn't come until they heard the voice of their shepherd. You can say the same words, but it's, it's the nature that's on the words. As a matter of fact, this might be a little too spiritual for some people, but when uh, I was never going to get married, Jennifer was widowed and never going to get married, and we're at a conference, and I heard her voice, and my knees buckled. There was something in that voice that I knew and registered in my spirit. That's her. That's without turning around to see who it was. So if I could do that and hear God's voice in a marriage relationship, how much more should his sheep hear his voice in every situation, right? And I'm, I didn't know where to put it even at the time. I said, she sounds like me. And then I turned around and looked at her and go, oh, she's too young for me. She's, oh, I can't be, uh, she's too pretty. She's too, 
Beautiful. Dennis, you're living in la-la land. You've been through a hard time, and you probably, you're probably need to just take this stuff to the Lord and get, get your act together here. But the day before, the Lord says, you're going to meet your wife, and she's going to ask to pray for you. She's going to pray for you and ask you to pray for her. And so I'm looking at her, and I'm going, oh, jeez. And then she goes, this is a woman who ran from men because she was widowed. And say, God, you can stop me if you want, God, but I'm running. She turned. All of a sudden, she says, I want to pray for you. Boy, my stomach just about fell out. I go, oh, no. This is just what happened yesterday. This is what God said. And you can read the rest of that in the book. <laughs> but there's something in the voice. There's a nature. But here's the thing that I want to close with. And I want you to pay attention. I'm going to do a whole sermon on it, but I want to give it food for thought. This is something clearly God is speaking to the body. There is a difference. If you're a note taker, write this down. Do you know the difference between serving God and working for God? Because the deficiency that I see when people are relationally struggling is they do not minister to God, they minister for God. It's Mary and Martha, okay? And you could even be misunderstood. Wasn't Mary misunderstood? Lord, I've got all of this stuff. And he goes, you're distracted with many things. I'm believing that if you don't learn how to minister to God first, we have a thing called simple prayer. We call it daily prayer. But when I look back on the school of the Spirit, what God was teaching me, He taught me, a hyperactive person, that unless you sit still and quiet your flesh, you don't even meet Him. I know people just read their daily bread and read the Scriptures, and they're, they're all hyper, and they go, there, I put my time in. You have not even met Him until you've ministered to Him by quieting your noisy mind, will, and emotions. If you want to get up and pace, if you just have to pray in tongues, if you just have to pray out loud, all of that stuff is good, but if you have to, there's a problem there with your flesh. You haven't learned to be still and know that I am God. You haven't learned to let go, let drop. And David says, like a weaned child with its mother, I have quieted my soul within me. Once you quiet your soul, you meet him spirit to spirit. Then, that, then you're in prayer. Then you can prophesy, you can proclaim, you can decree, declare, you can supplicate, you can do petition, you can do whatever you want, but you've made a legitimate connection. And even when I've made the legitimate connection, you know what he told me? You don't have anything to say until you heard something. So then I shut up again, and I realized that I wasn't that good at listening. I used to preach to God. Like, 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 like he needed it, right? But God's discipled me through Isaiah 50, verse 4. Morning by morning, I'm going to awaken your ear to hear, which means I'm going to do the talking, Dennis, and you do the listening. And for a talker, that was not easy. And what was even worse, I interrupted him a lot at first. He would say, like, like he would say, Oh, the wisdom. And he would start on, I have been made unto him wisdom. And I go, uh, redemption and revelation and, and God, you know, there's three different kinds of wisdom. And then there's uh, the wisdom for the goal. There's the wisdom for the how-tos. There's the wisdom for the total con And then I realized the anointing went away. What did I do wrong? I was just telling God what I knew. And he said, that's not the way it's going to work. And until you can minister to me, to come before me and just honor me, whether you get a word or not, you close your eyes, you honor me. He that honors me, him shall I honor. And that's when God says, I want your thoughts, your will, and your emotions. Uh-oh. I was kind of concerned about my thoughts, my will, and my emotions. No. And then... How do I honor you, God? He says, it just showed me from the scriptures. I don't want to grieve, quench, or resist you, which means I still have to stay still. 
And then any kind of prayer after that, after you meet him spirit to spirit is spirit led, not your, not your wants and needs. And his desires come up. You know what Mary was doing at the feet of Jesus? What was she doing? I want his thoughts and his desires. Martha was busy serving. Mary was busy waiting. Do we need both? Of course. But not until you've waited. After you've waited, you can serve. But ministry to the Lord must precede waiting. That's all I'm going to tell you. The rest is in. You have to come Christmas Eve, New Year's Eve. And if you miss it, well, there's Ustream and YouTube. So let's just pray. Father, right now, in the name of the Lord, you gave me my emotions. And I was bought with the price. I'm a thinking, feeling, choosing being. But here's the mistake we make accidentally in the church. We fail to offer our emotions to God. My emotions belong to Jesus. My emotions belong more to Jesus than they do my husband, my children. Unless you hate mother and father, you are not fit to be my disciple, says the Lord pretty strong language, isn't it? Because you can make an idol out of anything. Forgive me, God, for making emotional idolatry out of people, places, or things. Good people, good places, good things, but if, the, if it's more important than you, I need to relinquish my emotions back to you, Lord. So, Father, right now, we just pray this corporately. I was bought with the price. I'm not my own. I'm offering my body a living sacrifice unto the Lord, but that is mind, will, and my emotions belong to you. And if I truly walk it out, then peace is going to rule in my heart most of the time. That is the internal indication that Jesus is Lord, not just my Savior. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You've been listening to Pastor Dennis Clark and Dr. Jennifer Clark of Full Stature Ministries at Forgive123.com. Full Stature Ministries reserve all copyright protections under applicable law. Our copyright policy is available at our website, forgive123.com. For more information about Full Stature Ministries and additional life-transforming materials, please visit forgive123.com. Did you know that we have an online school available? Hi, I'm Pastor Jason Clark. We invite you to join our international community of almost a thousand students currently enrolled in a school like no other. Team Embassy equips believers to live in the spirit by giving them the how-to tools for wholeness, intimacy with God, and living the abundant life Jesus promised us. You will learn how to heal emotional pain quickly and completely. You'll discover amazing keys to tap into the fruit of the Spirit and practice the presence of God as a lifestyle. Exciting courses available include the 60-day challenge, self-deliverance, healing rejection, codependency, intimate prayer, the functions of the human spirit, and many, many more. It's formatted so that you could take it with you on all your mobile devices. Sign up today at training.teamembassy.com. Be transformed. Become all God created you to be. You will never be the same.